quantum computers. Okay, so the basic idea of quantum computers, the, the promise of quantum computers is quantum mechanics does things in parallel. And so you can sort of intrinsically do computations in parallel, and somehow that can be much more efficient than just doing them uh, one after another. And, you know, I actually worked on quantum computing a bit with Dick Feynman back in 1981, two, three, um, that kind of time frame, and, and we- it's a fascinating image. You you and Feynman working on quantum computers. <laughs> well, we, we tried to work, the, the big thing we tried to do was invent a randomness chip that would right. generate randomness at a high speed using quantum mechanics. And the discovery that that wasn't really possible uh, was part of the um, the story of, we never really wrote anything about it. I think maybe he wrote some stuff, but I we didn't, we didn't write stuff about what we figured out about sort of the fact that it really seemed like the measurement process in quantum mechanics was a serious damper on what was possible to do in sort of, uh, you know, the possible advantages of quantum mechanics in, for computing. But anyway, so, so the, the, the sort of the promise of quantum computing is, let's say you're trying to, you know, factor an integer. Well, you can, instead of, you know, when you factor an integer, you might say, well, does this factor work? Does this factor work? Does this factor work? Um, in ordinary computing, it seems like we pretty much just have to try all these different factors, um, you know, kind of one after another. But in quantum mechanics, you might have the idea, oh, you can just sort of have the physics try all of them in parallel. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, the, you know, the, and there's this algorithm, Shaw's algorithm, which, which uh, allows you, according to the formalism of quantum mechanics, to do everything in parallel and to do it much faster than you can on a classical computer. Mm -hmm. Okay, the only little footnote is you have to figure out what the answer is. You have to measure the result. So the quantum mechanics internally has figured out all these different branches, but then you have to pull all these branches together to say, and the classical answer is this, okay? The standard theory of quantum mechanics does not tell you how to do that. It tells you how the branching works, but it doesn't tell you the process of corralling all these things together. And that process, which intuitively you can see is going to be kind of tricky, but our model actually does tell you how that process of pulling things together works. And the answer seems to be, we're not absolutely sure, we've only got to two times three so far, in, in, uh, you know, which is kind of a, in, 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 this, um, in this factorization in quantum computers. But we can, um, uh, the, you know, what seems to be the case is that the advantage you get from the parallelization from quantum mechanics is lost from the amount that you have to spend pulling together all those parallel threads to get to a classical answer at the end. Now, that phenomenon is not unrelated to various decoherence phenomena that are seen in practical quantum computers and so on. I mean, I should say, as a, as a very practical point, I mean, it's like, should people stop bothering to do quantum computing research? No, because what they're really doing is they're trying to use physics to get to a new level of what's possible in computing. And that's a completely valid activity. Whether, whether you can really put, you know, whether you can say, oh, you can solve an MP-complete problem, you can reduce exponential time to polynomial time, you know, we're not sure. And, and I'm suspecting the answer is no, but that's not relevant to the practical speedups you can get by using different kinds of technologies, different kinds of physics um, to do basic computing. But so you're, you're saying, I mean, some of the models you're playing with, the indication is that... Uh, to uh, get all the sheep back together, uh, and uh, you know, to, to to corral everything together to get the actual solution to the algorithm, is uh, you lose all the you, you lose you lose all of the. By the way, I mean, so so again, this question: Do we actually know what we're talking about about quantum computing and so on? So again, uh, we're doing proof by compilation. So we have a quantum computing framework yeah. in Wolfram language, um, which is you know a standard quantum computing framework that represents things in terms of the standard uh, you know formalism of quantum mechanics, and we have a compiler that simply compiles the representation of quantum gates into multiway systems. Hmm. So, mm -hmm. and in fact, uh, the message that I got was from somebody who's working on the project who has managed to compile a, a, one of the sort of uh, a core formalism based on category theory um, in, uh, of uh, core quantum formalism into multiway systems. So when this, you say multiway system, these multiway graphs. Yes. yes. So you, you're, you're yeah, okay. That's awesome. And then you can do the, all kinds of experiments on that multiway graph. Right. Well, but the point is that what we're saying is 
the thing, we've got this representation of, let's say, Shaw's algorithm yep. in terms of standard quantum gates. And it's just a pure matter of sort of computation to just say that is equivalent. We will get the same result as running this multi-way system. Can you do complexity analysis on that multi-way system? Well, that's what we've been trying to do. Yes, yeah. we're getting there. We haven't done that yet. I mean, we, we there's a pretty good indication of how that's going to work out. And we've done, a, as I say, our computer experiments, we've unimpressively gotten to about two times three in terms of factorization, which is kind of about how far people have got with physical quantum computers as well. But but that's some, um, but yes, we will be able to, we definitely will be able to do complexity analysis and we will be able to know. So the one remaining hope for quantum computing really, really working at this formal level of you know quantum brand, exponential stuff being done in polynomial time and so on. The one hope, which is very bizarre, is that you can uh, kind of uh, piggyback on the expansion of branchial space. So yeah. here's, here's how that might work. So you think, you know, energy conservation, standard thing in high school physics, energy is conserved, right? But now you imagine, you think about energy in the context of cosmology, in the context of the whole universe. It's a much more complicated story. The expansion of the universe kind of violates energy conservation. And so, for example, if you imagine you've got two galaxies, they're receding from each other very quickly. They've got two big central black holes. You connect a spring between these two central black holes. Not easy to do in practice, but let's imagine you could do it. Now, that spring is being pulled apart. It's getting, getting more potential energy in the spring as a result of the expansion of the universe. So, in a sense, you are you are piggybacking on the expansion that exists in the universe and the sort of violation of energy conservation that's associated with that cosmological expansion to essentially get energy. You're essentially building a perpetual motion machine by using the expansion of the universe. And that is a physical version of that. It is conceivable that the same thing can be done in branchial space to essentially uh, mine the expansion of the universe in branchial space as a way to get uh, sort of uh, quantum computing for free, so to speak, just from the expansion of the universe in branchial space. Now, the physical space version is kind of absurd and involves, you know, springs between black holes and so on. Mm -hmm. It's conceivable that the branchial space version is not as absurd and that it's actually something you can reach with physical things you can build in labs and so on. We don't know yet. Okay, so you, yeah, you, like you were saying, the branchial space might be uh, uh, expanding and there might be some something that could be exploited. Right. In the same kind of way that that um that you can exploit the um uh you know that expansion of the universe in principle yeah. uh, in physical space. You just have like a glimmer of hope. Right. I think that the look I think the real answer is going to be that for practical purposes, you know, the official brand that says you can you can, you know, do exponential things in polynomial time is probably not going to work.